What is up, champion puppy owners? Do you want a streamlined ownership experience? Do you want a socialized dog with manners, responsiveness, and general life skills? Great, you're in the right place. This podcast is for the accountable puppy owner who wants to better know and grow their dog. Welcome to, or welcome back. So what we've been talking about this week is confinement. So initially we talked about why, then we talked about when, last podcast we talked about how, and now we're going to talk about different kinds of confinement because I don't want your thinking to be confined to just confinement as being a crate. I really want you to understand that going back to what actual confinement is, is it's just a focus tool. Get your dog focused on winding down, chewing a bone, going to sleep, and creates what should be a little den for your dog. It's not a punishment. It's something we use proactively as part of a staple to a nice, tight daily regimen, what we refer to as the champion's daily regimen. With this in mind, let's talk about other kinds of confinement tools. One being the leash, okay, what I often refer to as umbilical cord training, almost as if that leash is attached to your belly button. And um, next, we're going to talk about using baby gates, and why I'm not a big proponent of pens. So let's start with the umbilical cord training. First, keep in mind, eventually you can let your dog just drag the leash where you just step on it if, let's say, your dog needs a a little bit of focus, right? Because that's what we're using it as. So let's say your kid walks in a room and um, your puppy goes to like run after the the kid. Uh, Otherwise, this puppy up until now has been sitting here chewing on its bone like a good boy. Then you would just step on a leash. And you'll eventually get to the point where that will be enough to focus your puppy back on that bone because your dog has an already existing relationship with that bone. It's used to being shut down and accepts no, and then just let your kid go, go to the refrigerator and get his drink or whatever. Now, rewind back to what might be your current reality. I'm going to need for you to actually, um, as you sit down, uh, drape that leash across your quads, you know, across your lap. If your puppy goes to get up, you might have, let's say in this case, your right hand, if your right hand is, is your dominant hand, just kind of put the kibosh on your puppy getting up and being able to move. So what we're not allowing your puppy to do is jump on you, leave a certain radius. Like we, it's very important that we don't let your puppy challenge this radius where it feels like if it makes a quick enough run for it, it can get away and get closer toward what it's you know trying to pursue. So we really want to just suck the fun out of your puppy trying to leave right there next to you. Where we borrow this from, and I know I've mentioned this on other podcasts, but it certainly bears repeating, is what we do with food-based training and training through play. So when we do food-based training, we want your puppy to come and engage with you over and over again to consume its meal. And if your puppy tries to leave, we're going to put our thumb and our pointer finger down on the leash where they're... Up until that point, there was just a little sag in the leash. So all we got to do is pull up on that leash by an inch or two, and it's going to kind of suck for your puppy. It's not going to be like we're offering like a correction where we're just like, knock it off, you jerk. But it's going to be a nice, quick, but light, constant pressure, almost nagging. And then from there, once your puppy sits, we're going to let off that pressure. Now, what we do um, when we're doing the obedience prep, and we're just kind of rolling out general concepts to training. I, I wouldn't even consider this training yet. I'd say it's kind of like in soccer where they have like the kids just like tapping the ball with their with their toe and, and they keep switching toes and they're just doing these basic drills. They're not playing soccer yet, but what they're doing is they're getting their body tuned to like, you know, having these quick motions that are very important uh, body mechanics that the coach want for their players to have second nature. And so that's a lot of what we're doing um, when we do the initial obedience prep. Because without that, like you're, your puppy's not going to have the muscle memory uh, and the, the putting two and two together, those associations of what we want to have leash pressure to mean. So leash pressure should either mean sit or go in the direction that I'm putting pressure on the leash. And for a lot of us, I have first, leash pressure is going to mean the opposite. It's going to make a puppy more resistant and it's going to make a dog want to pull the opposite way, right? And so we need to counter condition your pup. And so that's why a lot of times, kind of backtracking here a little bit um, so I I can bring it all home for you, is we'll do a food lure where your puppy's licking a piece of its kibble, sniffing it real uh, um, close where you're holding the kibble in your thumb and pointer finger and you're going back until your puppy keeps following that up over its head. And then if it wants to keep following that food because it really wants it, it's sitting down. 
So initially, when we're doing food lures, we might do a quick little food lure and say yes, and then release the food when your puppy's head just moved back an inch or two. And then we get two or three inches and four or five inches. And then your puppy does the whole shebang where it actually sits down. And we say yes, and we give not just one, but maybe two, three uh, pieces of food as we like praise your puppy. All right. Then you can start to add motion. Where then you, you, you say break, you walk away, your puppy comes over to you, you, you bang out another food lure, um, and then your puppy sits. And then you just kind of walk around your living room uh, doing this. Then um, you can start to not have the food in your hand do the actual food lore with the fake food is what I jokingly call it. Then once your puppy sits, you say yes and you give it real food. Um, and you can even start very early on not giving your puppy any food uh, every couple reps and just praising your puppy. So your puppy gets out of the habit of getting rewarded every single time. Sometimes your puppy might get one piece of food, sometimes two or three. Sometimes it might get none, but it always gets a reward. Some loving from you, some praise, all right? Now we're going to start to add the leash in there where you might go back, 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 start to do the food lure. But right before you're about to do the food lure, you're going to put a little pressure up on that leash attached to the harness. If you I really want you using a leash attached to the harness at first, especially if you haven't used the collar at all, because we're going to charge this communication system for the first two months or so with a leash attached to harness. And then once we take it as far as we can, we've plateaued outside around distractions. Then we go back and we just do the same thing we've been doing, but we attach the leash to the collar. And then I typically do a re-roll out where I'll do like a little bit of what I just talked about uh, with the food lore and just running your puppy through some really basic drills that it might already understand. But instead of doing it with leash attached to harness, we do it leash attached to collar because it might not know about the leash attached to collar and be overly sensitive with that, but it knows all the drills because we've banged them out thousands of times. Um, and so we're doing dually uh, something that your puppy is sensitive with, with something that your puppy knows. So there's an unknown and then there's a known. And so the hope would be is that if we can ride the coattails of what your puppy knows, that it makes the unknown a lot more digestible for your puppy. And then you don't have your puppy like boycotting or flailing around or really not liking the use of the leash attached to the collar. But if it's sensitive to it, it is doing some of those things, you know, or doing little nodes of them. We don't want them, your puppy doing a lot of them. Uh, but if your puppy seems like sensitive to it, oh, good. That's what we wanted. That's why we've been using the harness for the first two months of your puppy's existence in your home, uh, knowing that you're kind of fighting with one hand behind your back because we're making it harder on ourselves. We're having some delayed gratification, but it's intentional and it's going to give you a better finished product for the next 12 plus years, right? Okay. So now that we talked a little bit about how we get a puppy to go into a sit by putting that pressure on there, maybe even a little bit of spatial pressure as we take a step in right after we say sit. So we're moving back. We're collecting that leash. So it's primed in our hand right where we want for it to be. We say sit first. Then we take a little half a step in, put pressure up on the leash, and we immediately release that pressure once your puppy starts to sit. And then if it go, goes to stand back up as we're feeding it, we withhold that piece of food and we put pressure back on the leash. Then the second it sits, we give it its food and then we might give it another piece as it's sitting. But if it stands back up, well, then we withhold that piece of food and put that pressure back on again. So it's kind of like a counterbalance. Your right hand is feeding your puppy for sitting and your left hand is putting pressure on if it stands up. You sit, you get hooked up. You stand, you're gonna, I'm going to have this, uh, an, an, like this leash pressure on there that makes you yeah, a little bit uncomfortable. It's not horrible, but you know, you'd know you prefer not to have that happen. And on the other side of the, the number line, so to speak, you're going to get hooked up with something you like. So when we're doing this, we're working both sides of the number line. We're adding a punishment in something that your dog doesn't like, but we're also adding in something that your dog does like if, if it gives us what we want, right? And so how we get your puppy to go into a sit is going to be the same thing that we do to maintain the sit, which is just called a stay, right? That's all a stay is, is just a maintain sit. For me and in my system, I, it's very important that we get like stares from your dog. Um, and so that way we get your dog's mental focus, not just your dog's, you know, butt on the ground. Uh, that's a good starting point, but we really want for your dog to cue in with you a lot. Uh, that's a good sign of a well-trained dog who's, um, you know, well-dispositioned as we've been talking about in this podcast. All right. So that's how we keep the dog in the pocket in front of you. And we spend a lot of time breaking this down with our clients. Um, and a lot of times people want to graduate past this really quickly. Um, well, we will slow you down. And even for our, our advanced training clients, if I'm out there talking to a client in the parking lot and their dog pops up off that sit stay, like they need to be on top of that dog. 
And it takes a good couple of days of you really drilling this on the field and then from there transitioning off the field when you're doing this umbilical cord training, not just loosey goosey where you're slapping a leash on a dog and you know still being reactive, your puppy is right next to you. So if it goes to get up from its bone, boom, you're putting your, your right hand down on that leash put it in, in stonewalling your dog. And from there, it's eventually going to learn there's no point of trying, right? That it's easier just to sit there and enjoy that bone or go to sleep. If it tries to jump on you while it's mid lunge and it's right about to put its paw on your lap, you're just going to give a little pop on that leash attached to the harness. And just to interrupt the connection point. So not, not, it's not a hard level, like, you know, knock it off your little turd kind of a correction, but it's, um, it, it's enough just to interrupt that behavior and not warrant your puppy to try it again. It just didn't work out for your puppy. So it's going to knock it off its list of things to do. We're really looking to neutralize your puppy with this. Just kind of suck your involvement out of it, that you're almost like a machine, that you're like just a mechanism that the second your puppy goes to lose its focus, boom, you're on it. It's a lot like um, like the auto steering in my car. Like, so I, I have um, I have a car that, you know, it just, it can steer for me. And so it's it's a lot, again, just like like a machine. And there's times where I want you to be emotional with your puppy and engage and bond and, and you know, maybe you're, you're doing trainings for play or you're doing recalls and there's a time for us to, to let the, that, uh, that energy fly and really come together from an energy standpoint with our puppy. That's that active time, that sprint. And then there's a time where like you, we are, we, I might physically be next to you, but you're dead to me, little man. It's only you and your, your bone uh, or you and your dog bed as you're going to curl up in the fetal position and go to sleep. And the only reason why I'm here isn't to engage with you. It's to disengage you with the world that you're in so you can mind your own beeswax. And there's nothing wrong with that. It's okay that your dog can show focus and just sit there and do its thing. Umbilical cord training is absolutely huge. Now, I talked to you um, in last podcast about when it makes sense to use the crate. So when does it make sense to do umbilical cord training? Well, during the times that your puppy's not in the crate, when it's that chew down time, that sleeping time. All right. If you know you're going to have to get up like in like 45 minutes or an hour anyway and start like doing stuff around the house, you're going to have to turn over the laundry and um, go pick your, your kid up from the bus stop and you know, uh, jump on a web conference. You might opt then to use the crate because you're not just thinking one step ahead, but you're thinking a couple steps ahead where if you have to get up and get active, well, then you're going to want your puppy in the crate with the crate covered in a room that's dark, quiet, isolated from, from the rest of the house with the ALE, with the ALEXA really close to it, playing some, some jazz music. I personally like the Kenny G. So that's kind of like a determining factor is to one, going by just that daily outline of when it makes sense to use the crate a half hour or so around breakfast time, mid morning for about three hours, let's say nine to 12. We do the power hour and a half at lunch. Then from there, we use a crate mid-afternoon, again at dinner time, maybe a little bit in the evening. Also thinking about your actual schedule. So use that to give you some bearing as to does it make sense to do actual crate confinement with my dog or umbilical cord training, having them right there under your thumb next to you. And so you're going to let that leash drape over your laps and you are creating a crate just because you can't see it doesn't mean that there's not a crate to the right side of you if you're like most people who are right-handed. You might have to initially stand with your puppy until your puppy settles, then you sit down. If your puppy flares up, you might stand back up again. So I oftentimes picture like when my kids were infants and we were um, going out to eat as a young couple and one of us wouldn't wouldn't eat. You, you One would stand up and rock the baby and get the baby settled so the other person could eat. And then if we got the baby settled, we earned the right to sit down with the rest of our family and sit there and eat, right? And so same is true that do we want to let a baby cry out the, the whole time you're at a restaurant trying to eat? Or do you want to spend a couple minutes getting that baby settled? Then from there, we've earned the right to sit there and house our food, right? So same is true with, the, with getting your dog situated on that bone. You might pop open that laptop and not really work too much. Or again, you might, uh, you might be standing before you really go to town on your meal because it puts you in a better position from a body mechanic standpoint and from a position of authority and control. So for me, I'm willing to like maybe just, you know, eat with my hand or, you know, just, just kind of log into my computer and, and get that puppy settled on that bone. And then when I see that that puppy's taken, then I start to sit down. The puppy stands back up and I feel like I can't handle it from a seated position. I'll stand back up again. But remember, in the Champions Daily Regimen, we do this 
after we've already made that communication and energy investment and getting your dog's energy out for that sprint. So that's why it's very important that we uh, do the sprint first. We burn your puppy's primal energy. We develop your puppy to, to take to these cues a lot better. Um, we have a more workable, moldable dog that's going to be more prone to get in this submissive state where it accepts chewing its bone. Um, because if you woke your puppy up, took your puppy to go out to the bathroom, put your puppy in this on this bone, if it's a high enough value bone uh, and your puppy's like in the mood, it might take to it. But if not, you're making it harder on yourself than it has to be. So that's why it's very important that we go through this Champions Daily Regimen because it's just the um, the way that makes sense, right? Like you wouldn't try to do a workout when you're super tired. You know, maybe you just you, you, you get in the zone, but um, you know, you do things in a particular order in your day because they make sense. For me, I do my best creative work in the morning. I like to do my workouts in the morning because that's just what makes sense for my circadian rhythms and how I can best produce material and do workouts. Same is true with your puppy. Don't overthink it. All right. That's umbilical cord training. So it's a lot more than just, you know, slapping a leash on the dog and pulling on your dog and having your dog pull on you. Um, you really should feel like you can put the kibosh on your dog's um, bad behavior before it really starts to flare up. And that's playing defense. Offense, we're getting your puppy hooked on that bone until eventually you can just let the leash be on the ground. Because now, as a percentage being passed off of you having to curb your, your puppy's uh, lack of attention, your puppy is taking more and more of that percentage. You're spotting your dog with that leash until just like a personal trainer spotting its client, like your client can lift the weight. Your puppy, you know, you're the personal trainer. Your puppy can now bear that weight until, again, so something might come in and your puppy can't. And at which point your puppy is good enough where you can just step on the leash. You don't have to actively have your hands be right on time and, and put the perfect stonewall kibosh on your dog popping up out of that position that you can sloppily spot your dog. And that's more than enough to keep your dog's focus until eventually you don't have to. All of a sudden you reflect and I have a client do this to me yesterday on a, a phone appointment. They said, we didn't have an accident for three weeks or like my dog just stopped nipping. And I just said to my husband, Connor hasn't done this for like three weeks. Yeah, so then once you get to that point, still let, like still have your puppy drag the leash, but then you just kind of sit there and think like, wow, I think we're kind of like out of the relief zone and maybe we need to just, then you're just chipping away at obedience training and responsiveness. Because remember, I have two different big shifts that I have for my client. Initially, it's relief. It's getting drives aligned, getting chewing through the roof, getting food consumption through the roof so we can put that to work for us, getting play through the roof so we can actually burn that energy and, tr and train in a way where we're doing, again, sprints, developing while we're burning energy. Then from there, uh, we get this nice clean routine like we're talking about um, on this segment of our podcast series. Then eventually we move to responsiveness, but hopefully you could already tell even in this podcast what we do with food-based training and our obedience and training through play, we very much use when it comes to management. And if you're just doing like using the tool uh, without charging it, you're just using the bone without forming the relationship, that's where you get zero synergy. It's harder on yourself than what it has to be. And you will get some results. Things will get better for you but you don't get that tight, crisp day as what I know you can get. And that's that's really where I spend extra time kind of helping my clients see the connectivity be between the coach and the manager, okay? That way we can keep the ref on the bench. But if the ref needs to, as I already kind of mentioned in this podcast, putting that kibosh, like saying, nope, sit here and, and do nothing. That's, that, that's still a little bit more the manager, but it, it really keeps it where we don't have to sit there and really have it out with your puppy. Because think about it. As a business leader, as a parent, you know, as, as somebody um, in an authoritative position, if you're yelling, if you're penalizing, if I'm writing people up, like, yes, there's a, there, there might be a, a component to that. And obviously, we want to keep it professional when it comes to like refing our puppies, just like we want to keep it professional. I don't want to yell at my staff. I, I, would, I would want to write them up and you know, go, go through a specific process in a way where uh, it's fair, they understand, and same is true when it comes to refing our puppies. It should be minimal. I should spend as little time as possible doing that as a company if I have the culture and the infrastructure done correctly. And same is true with you as a puppy owner. Okay. So I just beat to death in umbilical cord training. The other is baby gates. Now, baby gates, 
can be used as a safety to umbilical cord training. So I, I picture baby gates as like, you know, the safeties in like a, a, on a football team, right? Where they're there in case umbilical cord training gets sloppy, be by you or somebody else in your household. Or if your dog's doing pretty darn good and you just want to like make it where your, your puppy's kind of hanging with you versus going in and, and going with the other members of the family where it might start to like, you know, get into trouble and, and, and develop bad habits because you, your kids aren't as on top of it as you are, or more maybe there's more things in the living room than there are in the kitchen. Like the kitchen's more puppy proof than what the living room is. And that way your kids can you know, go on the ground and play and, you know, you can you know be in the kitchen with your puppy as, as it's chewing and, and you're doing like meal prep or clean up in the kitchen. So that's how you would use baby gates. Not a lot to say there, but pens. Pens can, they can work, but they can also be um, dangerous in that they give a false sense of security. So if I'm going to use a pen, the, the problem, well, the reason why I, I don't recommend my clients use a pen is sometimes it gives too much of an open area. The dog can go to the bathroom. And there, that's probably the biggest reason why I don't recommend pen usage. And to me, it's just a lot cleaner to develop a dog's natural integrity, doing the umbilical cord training. And then from there, you just kind of start to loosen the reins, as I already mentioned when I was talking about umbilical cord training, where you start to you know put the, the leash on the ground and you just step on it versus really having your dog right there with the leash draped over your lap with just a little bit of slack on it. So to me, the pen isn't something that you can like cleanly graduate off of. If you already own one, it might work for you. But a lot of times there can be some, again, negative externalities involved with the pen, typically around potty training um, is the big one. I just go for the crate, go for the leash as my primary two confinement tools. And then um, once your dog shows to have integrity and, and can uh, drag a leash and um, just uh, be in like, let's say like initially a kitchen by itself, then you would use baby gates. Now, I just want to take a second to remind you if your dog is tired, your dog is on a bone, your dog recently went to the bathroom and didn't drink a ton of water or isn't sitting on a load that we're expecting to drop relatively soon, you might be able to go run the laundry upstairs and come back downstairs. But if your puppy is any one of those above things or anything else that might come to mind for you and your, your puppy's uh, historical behavior, you need to always adapt. Once your puppy shows to have integrity, sometimes with the conditions being perfect, doesn't mean that your puppy is past that point. So your puppy, again, might be tired, might have a bone, your kid might not be home, um, your puppy might have just gone to the bathroom. Doesn't mean that, you, that your puppy is always going to be successful. It might be successful because in that moment, the conditions are just right. And so we're going to talk a little bit more about really adapting to stopping using the crate here in future uh, podcasts this week and making sure that you're, you're setting your puppy up for success and you're adapting to your puppy for its situation. Because as discussed in our prior podcast, our goal with using the crate is to stop using it. My goal is to stop using the crate as quickly as we possibly can, but not in a way where we're sloppily, haphazardly letting the crate fall by the wayside prematurely. So with that said, uh, look forward to seeing you on tomorrow's podcast. Hopefully you're getting a lot out of this. And remember, the crate is great. And so is umbilical cord training, but you have to be able to communicate with your puppy effectively doing these different drills to really have this all go full circle. Uh, we offer courses that can help you really take your mechanics and handling skills to the next level. So then that way you can come and apply it all day long and uh, making sure that there's not a disconnect between the obedience work that you're doing and the actual utility factor, uh, the other 23 and a half hours out of the day. All right, guys, I'll see you tomorrow. Remember champion puppy owner, action over anxiety, discipline equals freedom. Take the next step, do what you know how to do. Drive the puppy training process. Truly commit yourself to this and hit it hard for a short period of time so you can stop working on your dog simply enjoy them. I'll see you next time.